just to kind of cut to the chase, the banking crisis is not over. The crises don't happen all at once in one day. They emerge, regulators deal with them, the other new investors come in, they go, it's all good, we got this under control, and then there's a quiet period, and then they just pop back up again. It's because they were never fixed in the first place. Let me explain why the banking crisis is not over. And for here, we're going to use a little financial history, which is underrated, but in my view, extremely valuable. Maybe just because I've been around long enough. I'm kind of a, a magnet for trouble when it comes to this. My first banking crisis was the Herstadt Bank in Germany in 1974. You have to have been around a while to remember that one. That was a foreign exchange. That was a bank where, in those days, if you were in Germany in the U.S. and you were doing foreign exchange trading uh, and you sold those Deutschmarks because it was before the euro, if you sold for dollars, you would, or bought them rather, they would deliver the Deutschmarks to you in German time and then you would pay the dollars in New York time. They failed in between. They got all the Deutschmarks, but they never paid the dollars because they failed in the middle of the day. And uh, that started a crisis. But anyway, it's a long list. But let me, let me point to uh, two in particular. So the first one, one I had some front row seat, 1997-1998, the Asia-Russia LTCM financial crisis. Now, what people don't realize, people remember you know, September 1998, you know, LTCM's got, go under, about to go under $1.3 trillion in derivatives. That's back when a trillion was real money. The Fed had no interest in bailing out a hedge fund. I was there. I was their lawyer. Uh, we didn't expect to bail out. We're like, why would the Fed bail out us? Why would the Fed do that? Well, the answer was, it wasn't about us. It was about the 19 banks that were going to fail if we fail because they're dealers. So if they sell us, you know, $1.3 trillion of derivatives, which they did, they buy them from the other side. And they're, they're relying on the fact that they have a two-sided position and they make a spread. That's what they do. If one side of the trade goes away, all of a sudden they're net sure, they're naked on the other side and they got to go out and sell stocks like $15, $15 billion worth of stocks to cover the fact that they were long that much on, this, on their side of the swap. Well, I can tell you what $15 billion of uh, fire sales stocks will do the stock market. They would have closed the New York Stock Exchange and a lot else besides. So technically, they were bailing us out. We got $4 billion in cash, uh, put the fire out. But they were really bailing out Wall Street. We lost the money. Wall Street put in the $4 billion, but then Wall Street owned it. And they got all their money back a year later, but, but they, they put out the fire. But here's my point. That didn't start in September 1998. That started in June 1997 in Thailand. Thailand had a run on the bank. Dollars were leaving the country. They had pegged the Thai bot to the dollar uh, and people panicked. They said, because money had been going in for resorts and casinos and what else. And everybody wanted their money back, taking the dollars out. The Central Bank of Thailand could not maintain the peg. They imposed capital controls. Said no more dollars and we're going to devalue the bot, uh, which meant for a U.S. investor, all that was, all your money was worth a lot less. That then spread to pretty quickly spread through Asia and then it went to Korea. But here, here's the point it entered a quiet period in December, January, February. Things calmed down and everyone said, it's okay. And by the long term capital was fine. We, at the time, we were, we were like looking into Asia for investment opportunities. But then it came back in April in a small way because Sandy Wild was selling. He was merging city and, and travel. And he told the Solomon guys, I don't want any volatility in earnings because I don't want to mess up this deal. So you guys have to reduce your books. But the process of Solomon getting out of swaps, widen the spreads, we're sitting there long term like, hey, spreads are blowing out, buy more. And then, of course, it came to a head in August, Russia defaulted on their internal debt, their external debt, and devalued the ruble. It was like a trifecta. And then that caused the panic, and then it got worse, and then finally the bail at the end of September. But my point is that took a year and almost a year and a half. It was a long quiet period in the middle. So just when you, when you see a crisis evolving and then there's a quiet period, don't assume it's over. It just means that things have been patched up, but it's still percolating below the surface. The second one, of course, the 2007, 2008, 2009 global financial crisis. Now what happened there? Everyone remembers September 15, 2008, midnight on a Sunday, Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy, okay? That started in the spring of 07. HSBC reported lower than expected earnings because mortgage losses on subprime mortgages were higher than expected. And that's when Bernanke actually is on the record in the March uh, minutes of the FOMC said, this will blow over. Yeah, and then it kind of came to a head in August 07, 
That's when Jim Cramer and Aaron Burnett on CNBC goes, they know nothing. They know nothing. And Cramer was right. They actually didn't know anything. But the Fed like cut the discount rate and they and they cut the Fed funds rate. And then September, you remember all the September 7, Hank Paulson's Treasury Secretary, he announced the Super Civ, you know, special investment vehicle that was going to buy all the credit card receivables from all the banks with government money and then put them into a fund and work them out and all this stuff, which never happened, by the way. It was a dumb idea, but it never happened. But then in December 2007 into January 2008, what happened? The sovereign wealth funds bailed out the U.S. banking system. Abu Dhabi, and they, they were capped at 10%, but Abu Dhabi bought 10% of City, Temasek in Singapore bought, I think, 10% of Morgan Stanley, Kuwait Investment Fund. One by one, those sovereign wealth funds bailed out the U.S. banking system. So January, all good. February, it's all good. What happens in March? Bear Stearns blows up because it wasn't all good. That was the point. By the way, if you ever see a CEO saying it's all good, get your money out then. It's not that they're lying. It's just that they don't realize how quickly things can change. So then, okay, so March, Bear Stearns blows up. What's hap what happens in June? Fannie Mae. What happens in July? Freddie Mac. What happened in August? The Congress passed legislation bailing out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So once again, this is your second quiet period. It's all good. You know, the Congress saved the day. Even though Bear Stearns, Fannie and Freddie had just blown up, the Congress in theory bailed them out and it was all good. And that lasted about a month and then September, here comes Lehman. So, so my point is financial crisis can have one or more quiet periods. In fact, they usually do. Everyone remembers that when the, the you know the Krakatoa erupted, but they don't know when the when the shaking began. They forget that these things usually have a year or longer. So if that's the case, and it is the case, I mean those are just the facts. What should we say about the 2023 banking crisis? Well, we had this again: March 9th, March 10th, March 12th, March 19th, May 1st. The sequence of failures, big ones, including Credit Suisse, were in the quiet phase. Everyone thinks it's all good. So let's put a finer point on that, and I'll go through this quickly. Downward sloping yield curves. Now that you know, yield curve is just the x-axis are the maturities, the y-axis is the interest rates. Yield curves are supposed to be upward sloping. So the longer the maturity, the more interest you're supposed to get. If I'm lending to you for one month, I want a certain rate. If I'm lending to you for 10 years, I want a higher rate because I'm taking more risk, more bad things can happen. Well, the yield curves are actually going down. What does that mean? It means that the big money, the wholesale money, expects a recession, maybe a financial crisis, and they think interest rates are going to drop like a rock. So why would I take less on my 10-year note than on my one-month treasury bill? Well, the answer is I think I think that 4% on the 10-year treasury note is going to look pretty sweet when rates hit 2%. So that's what the market is betting. So it goes back to collateral shortage, bill shortage, dollar shortage, shrinking balance sheets, liquidity. There's a whole global liquidity financial crisis coming at the same time there's this whole recession coming.